it's amazing the world of insight that can open up to you just from a walk under starry skies. I'd like you to consider with me four phrases from today's readings. The first one prompted by David's walk out under the stars in Psalm 8, 7, after he's looked up and, and contemplated the, the wonder of the starry sky, he looks at himself and around himself and says, you give him mastery over all the works of your hands. You put all things in subjection under his feet, under humankind's feet. He finds himself in awe of the fact that we humans are the crown of God's creation, crowned with glory and honor, made overseers of a dominion where everything is life, no death, cooperation minus coercion or corruption, production, production without pollution, or exploitation, or waste. I love the way that the artist Ari Grotus envisions our relationship with creation. Adam's form comes up from the earth. His posture is one of wondrous praise. He, in front of him, is a white nimbus, and across the nimbus are the words Bereshit, Hebrew, in the beginning. And the glory shines off of him and produces the fish and the sea and the birds of the air, even the stars. Now, of course, that's the reverse of the order of the story in Genesis 1, but it, it captures the biblical logic of us, mere humans, being the fulcrum and the crown of God's creation. But that takes us to the second of today's phrases. This one from Hebrews chapter two, verse eight. And yet, we do not see all things in subjection to them. And yet, we do not see all things in subjection to them. What an understatement. The writer to the Hebrews walks through that incredible vision that David had in Psalm 8, but he concludes that's not what we see. That's not what we experience ourselves as pinnacle of God's creation. What we experiences as it is. We are not crowned with glory and honor. As it is, we are not large and in charge. As it is, we are not lords and ladies of all creation. In a second painting, Ari Grotus captures this as it is, insight. The painting is entitled Paradise Lost because since the garden, all things have not been in subjection to us. Since the garden, we've been on the run. In this painting, in this painting, Adam and Eve are fleeing in abject terror. Creation has D devolved into indistinct, and into uh, creation has devolved into this serpentine circle of of destruction, as as the the wonderfully distinct matters of creation have have dissolved into into indiscreet blobs, except except the ones that still look like the forbidden fruit. Adam and Eve have dropped the forbidden fruit with the bite out of it, and it lies there at the front of the picture. And as they run seeking refuge, it's almost like 
Some of those blobs have transformed back into the forbidden fruit, about to rain down destruction on them. That's the way life feels, as it is, as it is. We were made to be the crown of creation, but here we are. Here we are trying to protect ourselves from an ironically named coronavirus. Corona being the Latin word from which we get the word crown. Uh, a corona is supposed to be a, a, a wreath of honor, a garland of majesty. And the microscopic coronavirus is covered itself with super microscopic little crowns. And when the, the, when, when the coronavirus invades our being, it attaches itself to our lungs, the very apparatus by which we breathe and take in life, attaches itself to our lungs with those grabby little crowns. takes dominion and seeks to kill us. It's brought our economy to its knees. It's made us put on masks against one another. It's, it's made us afraid to be any closer than six feet away from each other. As it is, as it is, we do not see all things in subjection to us. What we experience is a feeling of being under attack, living in fear, gasping for air. But that takes us to our third phrase for the day. This happens to be the seventh Sunday of Easter, where we remember Christ being risen from the dead, and it also happens to be the day that we are celebrating his ascension. The fact that not only has he been raised from the dead, but he has risen to reign and to be with his people. And so the third phrase that I'd like you to think about today is in the very next verse, Hebrews 2.9. But we do see Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews doesn't quote Psalm 8 because he wants to drive us further into despair. Rather, he would have us look up and see Jesus at the right hand of the Father, our pioneer and our champion there in advance of us. The one who for a while was made lower than the angels who suffered death and tasted death for everyone, now crowned with glory and honor for and in advance of us. He is there because paradise has been regained. And that's why as we worship week after week here in the Cathedral Church of St. Luke, we worship under this stunning statue of the risen and ascended Jesus who is among us with arms outstretched to welcome us, to protect us, to strengthen us, and to send us. The writer to the Hebrews describes him in this passage that we've read today as there at the right hand of the Father to proclaim the Father's holy name to us in blessing. He does for us now what the, what the priests in the book of Numbers were told to do when they placed God's name in blessing on his people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, which means to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Another thing that the writer says in this passage 
is that the risen and ascended Jesus sings a hymn of praise to the Father in praise of the Father who has delivered him and delivered his people. The Lord Jesus Christ, we celebrate and remember this day, is one who proclaims that a full redemption has been won for us and that we have had our hearts sprinkled our, our, so that our evil consciences are cleansed and our bodies have been washed with pure water, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, and that he sings us out of the shame of our guilt and into his fellowship with brothers and sisters, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Jesus Christ has risen and ascended where he proclaims, and I dare submit loudly, that the one who had the power of death, the devil, who for years and years and years has kept people in slavery of the fear of death, has been defeated, and we have been delivered, and who leads us and, and, and molds our voices to sing his praise for the wonderful forgiveness that he has won for us and the mercy and the help that is ours in time of need. Hebrews chapter two, verse 18, and chapter four, verse 16. And that takes us finally to our fourth phrase from today's gospel reading in Matthew. Lo, I am with you to the end of the age. A theme picked up in our collect for the day, praying that we would have the grace to know that he abides with us, that he dwells within us and will do so forever. My prayer for you today is that you know that the risen and ascended Jesus is with you. If you have never asked him to be with you, ask him, use words like this, holy and gracious Father, I know that in your infinite love you made us, not just us, but me for yourself. And when we, uh, when I had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your eternal and your only son, to live and die as one of us in, for me in my place, to reconcile me to you the God and Father of all. Your son stretched out his arms on the cruel cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice, not just for the world's sins, but for mine. And this day I, I, I forsake all other ways of finding ultimate satisfaction in my life of fighting off everything that I'm afraid of, of overcoming my own anxieties and fear and guilt. And I ask, Father, to let him live in me by the Spirit, that I might know you as my heavenly Father now and forever. That's all it takes to know that he is within. And the second thing is, I, I, would, I would pray for you that you would know him as you live for him, knowing that there's no task that he gives you, that he's not give you everything you need for, and that he is not there to be with you, just as he has been for the last 25 years with our friend Robert Stewart, who has so faithfully served brothers and sisters in this community who need food and who need clothing through the Christian Service Center. We salute and celebrate his retirement from that ministry, but also, more importantly, salute the fact that he has known that the Lord Jesus Christ has sustained him. May the Lord give you this day the strength to do 
what he's called you to do with him alongside you. I don't know what that looks like. Maybe it's, well, it's your equivalent of what generations of shakers have done as they crafted their saddleback, their ladderback chairs to his glory. Or, and even going back to the, to the 18th century when they figured out how to weave cloth that was rain repellent. Whatever the Lord has given you to do, whether it's gardening, whether it's visiting, whether it's picking up the phone, whether it's using words, may he give you the grace to know that he is with you every step of the way. And finally, I pray for you that even in the moment of death itself, that you will know that the Lord Jesus is with you. So that when that day comes, and may it be long into the future, when that day comes and death shows up at your door, you can say, Mr. Death, you can take my body. But know that when you put your arms around me and I fall asleep, all you're holding is a carcass. I wake up in the arms of my Jesus, my pioneer and my champion. And one day, I will be back in my new and resurrected body like his, with him and with all my friends. And when we come back, when we come back, you won't be here anymore because your day will be done. May the Lord give you his sense of his presence now and to the end of time. And now in his name and on his behalf, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.